Um, as you can imagine, we've received quite a few questions regarding polygamy. Um, for example, a young adult from Utah asked, I've struggled for years to come to peace about polygamy in the early church. Why was it necessary for Joseph Smith and many other leaders to practice it? And Morgan from Florida added, what do I tell my family when they ask about polygamy in the early days of the church? They aren't generally satisfied with the, well, we don't practice it anymore answer. Is it fair to ask you to answer this one, Kate? <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> uh, but I have studied polygamy. I actually descend from people who, who chose to practice plural marriage. I have great-great-grandmas and great-great-great-grandmas who, who did so. Two of them were named Sarah. It, it wasn't an easy path for them. One of them was the seventh wife, and she just didn't receive the resources and support that she needed to support herself and her children, especially after her husband died. Uh, one of them was a first wife, but all of the descendants say that it was the second wife that was the favorite <laughs> wife. The second <laughs> wife got to travel with the husband while the first wife took care of all the kids and did their laundry, <laughs> made their meals. Uh, but, but what I feel honored to descend from those two Sarahs and from their husbands. Their example has taught me to center my life on faith. And their example has taught me to keep putting one foot in front of the other and to do so prayerfully. To, to put their lives in a little bit of um, doctrinal and historical context, the instruction we have in the Book of Mormon about plural marriage. It's Jacob chapter 2 verse 30 and Jacob says monogamy is the Lord's wish for his people and there are rare exceptions where the Lord commands us to practice plural marriage in order to raise up a righteous people. This is the rare exception that Joseph Smith was commanded to instigate. In, in our our church history. And Joseph Smith didn't want to. And he dragged his heels, and he was reluctant for years to do this. But eventually, he did implement plural marriage because he wanted to be obedient to God's commandment to him. He tried a little to practice plural marriage in the middle 1830s, but it was really in 1841 that he more officially, slowly began to introduce the practice of plural marriage to his trusted associates. Uh, they, when they heard, they were shocked. Uh, they pled in prayer with their Father in Heaven for understanding of this principle. And they received spiritual witnesses to them personally that this was right for them at that time. Now, as plural marriage was practiced officially for about 50 years, it was always something that people could choose. Um, we, we don't have exact numbers, in, in part because our information is incomplete, and in part because it's complicated. So scholars are still trying to get us those numbers about how many adult Latter-day Saints actually were in plural marriages. But we know that it was a minority of people that were in plural marriages. And we know that many of them were the most devout, the most stalwart members of our church. So in 1890, uh, Wilford Woodruff issued a manifesto that was to end the practice of plural marriage. And when some people heard this manifesto, they were relieved. Plural marriage had been hard for them, and they rejoiced. And when some people heard this manifesto, they were devastated and they cried. They had sacrificed so much and they had testimonies of this principle. Now some of you, I know from your questions, wonder what does our past practice of plural marriage mean for the afterlife, for what will greet us after this life. Our church leaders have taught us that monogamy is the rule, and plural marriage is the exception. And our church leaders have taught us that plural marriage is not necessary for exaltation or for eternal glory. Now I, as a historian, 
and as a church member, have felt it really important that although I'm grateful personally that monogamy is the rule and plural marriage is the exception, that I not discount those testimonies and that honorable obedience of our spiritual ancestors who practiced this principle because they were being obedient and they had a testimony that it was right. Thank you very much, Kate. Matt, what would you like to add here? Well, Kate gave us a lot to think about there. I'll, I'll just add a, a few thoughts. As, as I think about plural marriage, it's important to remember that the vast majority of Latter-day Saints throughout time have lived in monogamous marriages and monogamous families. And to me, that reiterates what Kate was saying about uh, church leaders, the scriptures teaching us that plural marriage is an exception and monogamy is the standard. And to, to, to put it differently, uh, church leaders have taught us that a monogamous couple sealed in the temple and faithful to their covenants will, will receive all of the blessings of exaltation and eternity. From reading your questions about plural marriage, I know many of you have questions about Joseph Smith's practice of plural marriage. We don't have time to get into lots of those questions tonight, so I'd point you towards Saints and the Gospel Topics essays. In Saints, the, the history is told not just through the experience of Joseph Smith or other men, but through the experience of women such as Emma Smith and Emily Partridge and Mary Elizabeth Rollins Leitner. A couple things I would say to keep in mind about Joseph Smith's practice of plural marriage. The first is that we know that at that time there was a distinction between sealings for time and eternity that involved commitments in this life and sealings for eternity alone that only involved commitments in the life to come. We know that uh, some of Joseph Smith's sealings that appear unusual to us and are difficult to understand fall into that, into that category of sealings for eternity alone and seem to have been about creating links between families in the next life. The other thing I would say is that the revelation to practice plural marriage did not come with an instruction manual. And that any change on this scale, any change in doctrine, society, and culture on this scale of beginning plural marriage is going to be difficult, and it's going, there's going to be some unanswered questions. But historical documents do tell us about some of what plural marriage did for the Latter-day Saints. It helped bind the people together because it creates these large family networks. And Kate mentioned that one of the purposes in Jacob chapter 2 is to raise up seed or a righteous posterity. The family history records of the church, which are really extensive, tell us that about 20% of living church members descend from those who practice plural marriage. And we know that throughout time, those families have been a strength to the church. Thank you both. I just want to make three points. Uh, coming to the fruits of yeah. this, uh, it's clear that there was a lot of sacrifice in those uh, marriages. There was a lot of love and unity, but there was also sacrifice. And they taught their children to sacrifice. And those children of those plural marriages, uh, in the early years of missionaries going out to the world, many, many of them were taking the gospel of Jesus Christ across the world and blessing everybody with that gospel. The second one is, and I've always been touched by this, is that there were some, I'm thinking of Valet Kimball, who received their own personal revelation before they knew fully about what it was that this was, come, that guess this came from God. And the third one is that in the councils of the church, uh, in the senior councils of the church, uh, there's a feeling that polygamy as it was practiced uh, served its purpose and we should honor those saints but that purpose has been accomplished and that, that it isn't necessary. Now, there are unanswered questions, uh, and we don't always receive revelation on everything. <clears throat> President uh, Ballard and I were laughing about this the other day and saying, uh, when the millennium comes, there's a thousand years, and we're going to need a thousand years to uh, get the answers <laughs> to all of the issues that uh, surround everything. But I want you to know that we have a loving Heavenly Father who has a perfect plan, that his plan is one of happiness, that we have a savior who did everything for us, we can trust in them.